The reason for that is that the information in video games is usually given visually and graphically, hence the name video games. And that's not very accessible to someone who's visually impaired. For a visually impaired player, information needs to be given as either directly audio, so stuff like sound effects, or as text, which can then be converted into spoken word audio using a kind of software called screen reading software that's commonly used by visually impaired computer users. So that'll speak the text aloud to them. And there's been a lot of research and kind of games looking at how to make games accessible for visually impaired players. And the thing about this research is that a lot of it's been focused really strongly on accessibility and less so on the actual games themselves. And what this meant is that there's a lot of games that are fully accessible, but were pretty simplistic and not very replayable compared to the kind of games available for sighted players. It's really easy to make Battleship 100% accessible for a visually impaired player, but it's not going to make it a lot of fun compared to the kind of things that sighted players get to play. So we were interested in, is it possible to have both? In terms of roguelikes, you're at a roguelike conference. I assume you know what a roguelike is. But since the definition can be kind of fuzzy, what we were interested in were the kind of quote unquote classic uh, turn-based, dungeon crawling, ASCII graphic kind of roguelikes. So ones like Rogue, Angband, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. Funny thing, those were the examples I had like six months ago before I knew all of those developers are at this conference. <laughs> so <laughs> funny thing. Uh, yeah, so, and the thing about these games also is that they are very complex and very replayable, as I'm sure we all know. So these are just the kind of experiences that are not usually accessible for visually impaired players. The game we worked with specifically in our research was NetHack, and you just heard an excellent talk about why NetHack is great. But, uh, so it's been in development for 29 years, still in active development. It is a very complex roguelike. And the really interesting thing you might not know is that some visually impaired players already play NetHack. The way they do this is that because everything in NetHack is technically an ASCII character, a screen reader can read it aloud as hash dot 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 hash at, and it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but some people want to play NetHack so bad <laughs> that they do it anyway, which is remarkable. And we thought, well, we can do better than that. <laughs> And there's also some games in the roguelike genre which are completely accessible. This is a screenshot of a game called Kerkerkrop, which is a purely text-based roguelike. And that makes it 100% accessible because that text can be read aloud as screen reading so software into spoken word. So that's really cool. And then there's another game called Entombed, which is a 100% audio roguelike, which was made for visually impaired players. But an interesting thing about both of these games is that they get rid of the map completely. They don't have some kind of internal representation of a tile-based map. Instead, they do more what interactive fiction does, where you're in a room, and you can pick up items in that room, and you don't have to worry about exactly where you are. And this has a lot of gameplay ramifications. Stuff like combat is completely different in that kind of system when you don't have the actual tile-based map. It's more like, I choose to dodge or attack, and the monster chooses to dodge or attack. And these games are really great and are enjoyed by a lot of people, but the experience is quite different from playing a game like NetHack. So we wanted to see, can we preserve that experience? It's also interesting to note that some of these kind of classic roguelikes are semi-accessible for visually impaired players. Angband is one example where in the combat portion, Angband has auto-targeting, and it also has an ability to list nearby monsters. And this means that the combat part of Angband is all described in text. So that part is accessible. But exploring the map in Angband can't be done in a text kind of way. So effectively, it's only really playable for people with partial vision loss who are able to blow up the tiles really big and still have some kind of sight of the map. Dungeon Crawlstone Soup is another example where it has an auto-explore feature and this means that the exploration side is accessible because you don't have to be able to know what's going on in the map. You don't have to see it. You can just keep on using Auto Explore and you will move through the map. Downside of this is that if you're playing the game that way, you never know where you actually are and it's fairly disorienting. You're kind of just going from encounter to encounter. So it kind of completely removes the exploration aspect. So uh, visually impaired players enjoy playing it, but it's also not really a perfect example of how to play a roguelike. 
as a visually impaired player. So the research that we did was we really wanted to see if we could keep the full complexity of NetHack and make it accessible. And the idea was we do this by adding new commands to the game, which would give information that was previously available visually as text. In the end, it would hopefully be possible to play NetHack without having to see the map at all. To go over some of the commands that we added, the first kind of big category was command that gave you information about your surroundings as text. So the kind of bread and butter of it was a view command that when you press it, gives you a text list of everything around you that you can see. So objects, monsters, dungeon features, doors, stuff like that. And also it gives you the exact location of those things in terms of how many tiles it is away from you uh, in each direction. This is where being tile-based is really helpful because <laughs> you can say exactly it's two tiles north. And you need this because to be able to actually play NetHack and be able to interact with things in the game, you need to know exactly where they are. There was also a command we added that let you feel tiles. So you'd go into a mode where you had a cursor in game, and as you moved it over tiles, it would say what the tile was so you could kind of feel out around you. And hallways were a special case where when you're in a hallway instead of a room, every time you move, you get a printout of how many tiles are kind of visible and accessible in each direction. And I'll talk later about why hallways were special like that. Another category of commands that we added were movement shortcuts. When it comes to playing NetHack as a visually impaired player, when we looked at what visually impaired players had to say, the really difficult thing was the kind of movement through the dungeon as a whole. Because to be able to do that, you would need to not just know your local surroundings really exactly so you know how to find the door, you also need to have made a kind of mental map of the entire dungeon and know what hallways lead to what rooms, what rooms had interesting things in them, and that's the most kind of taxing part of the game. And backtracking is especially frustrating because then you're going places you've already been. <laughs> so we thought, well, that's something we can maybe make better. We added a command that you can get a list of all the dungeon features you've seen. So things like staircases and altars and fountains, which usually is why you're going to a previous room. You don't usually want to go to an empty room anyway. And you get a list of those, and when you select one, you'll start automatically pathing back there. You might get interrupted, but it'll put you on the right path. So we wanted to just do things like that to minimize the most frustrating parts of the game for visually impaired players in a way that didn't take away from the gameplay experience. This is something that a sighted player doesn't even think about, but um, makes the game a bit easier to play. Another thing was in NetHack to pick up items, you have to stand directly on top of them. We made it so that if you can see an item, you can select it, it'll move you over there and pick it up. So just taking out some of the most frustrating parts of the game. Once we'd made these kind of changes and we had it at a good point where you could play the game without having to see the map, we did some tests with users. We did an in-person user study where we got uh, sighted players to come in. And what we did is give them a version of the game where the map was turned off. So they only got text, which is the same thing a visually impaired player would get. So it was kind of uh, same experience. And we also did an online study with visually impaired players where we gave them a version of the game and we said, hey, tell us what you think. And some lessons we got out of that. The first one is the most important one and also the most obvious one, but it always bears repeating, which is that doing this kind of work, there's really no substitute for getting the feedback directly from visually impaired players. They know what's best for them. And in this case, the screen reading software actually adds another level because that's a kind of software that most sighted people have never used and actually requires quite a bit of expertise to use effectively. So there were examples like, we had done it so that since we knew there were visually impaired players who played NetHack as it was, we thought, well, we'll leave the map in and we'll add our text commands. And then if our text commands aren't enough, they can use their screen reader on the map. It seemed to make sense to us. We give the game to visually impaired players and one of the first things they're asking for is, is there a way to turn off the map? Turns out screen reading software will usually, once it finishes reading the text line, automatically start reading out the map. So every useful bit of text is followed by hashes and dots and it's annoying. So yeah, we already knew how to turn off the map. It was easy to do, <laughs> but uh, stuff like that. You just need to get the feedback from the people who know what's best for them. Another thing is that visually impaired players all have different preferences like any other group of people. 
And so there are some things that there are multiple ways to do, and the best way to do it is to give an option, which is already kind of the roguelike ethos. We like our configuration files and our <laughs> ability to customize things to our every whim. Uh, but things like whether or not to describe tiles as north, south, east, west, or up, down, left, right, is things that people cared really strongly about. <laughs> but they had different strong opinions. <laughs> So there's no decision you can make that won't make 50% of your user base angry. So make it an option, <laughs> and people can play it how they like. Another thing is that one of the big benefits of a game like NetHack is how complex it is. But that also means that as a developer, there are so many special cases to account for. And it's really hard to think of those all up front. One good example is that um, if you've played NetHack, you're probably familiar with this. But you can steal from shops in NetHack using your pet. You let your pet go into the shop. You stand in the doorway, your pet will pick up and drop items, semi kind of at random, and if they drop it in the right square right in front of you, you can take it and the shopkeeper won't know that you stole it. And then you can kind of reinforce this behavior and stuff like that. And well, one of our users had played NetHack and knew about this and wanted to do it because it's great. We hadn't been thinking about it <laughs> when we were developing because it's not exactly core gameplay. So we thought that usually you go into a shop, you'd use the view command once to figure out what was in that shop, and you wouldn't really need constant updates unless something happened like a monster showed up. Well, to do this shop stealing, you need to know every single time your pet drops something, exactly where they drop it, and every time you use the view command, you're gonna get a list of everything in the shop read aloud to you, and it was not great. <laughs> so it was the kind of thing that we could totally do better, Doing something like making it so that when a monster drops an item, it tells you where they dropped it, or maybe just your pet, it tells you where they drop things. There are a lot of options that we could do better, but just stuff like that, it's so hard to think of it all ahead of time. So the best kind of way to do it is to get the users playing it, and they can tell you. So good news when we finished our talk, or our, um, our research, was that this genre really is super exciting in terms of accessibility because so much of these games is already text. The reason for that is because of this simple ASCII tile graphic system. ASCII is not able to give you much in terms of visual information other than where things are. So when you do something like drink a potion and you start levitating, it can't show you that in the ASCII. It has to describe it to you as text. And even when there is a graphic a depiction of something, there's often text to go along with it as kind of flavor. For example, as you zap a wand of lightning, you get a nice little graphic effect of it bouncing around the room, which is cool. But you also get a text description of everything it does because that adds kind of flavor. And what all this means is that so much of these games is already 100% accessible for visually impaired players. All that text is already accessible for them. And so it, it's relatively few changes to take these games to being completely accessible. And another thing we found that was uh, useful as a developer is that accessibility improvements can be useful for your whole player base in ways that are hard to predict. The view command is meant for visually impaired players, but it turns out that if you're someone who's kind of newer to NetHack and you don't know all of the ASCII super well, having a one-hit command that tells you what everything is that you can see, it's really nice. Even for someone who knows the ASCII, stuff like if you see a weapon on the other side of the room and you don't know exactly what it is, there's a one-hit command to figure out, oh, that's a silver saber, I should go get that. <laughs> and so as a developer, it's just more incentive. If you put the work in to thinking about accessibility, you'll often get unexpected benefits for all kinds of players. Now, there were also some compromises that we found in our work on NetHack. And the main one is that when you're doing this kind of text description, the real push and pull is between being um, descriptive enough to give the player all the information they need to play the game, but still trying to be immersive and not make them bored and give them tons of text. And sometimes we could do this pretty well. The view command was a pretty nice example where you got all the information you needed to play, but most of it was fairly immersive. You know, you see your little dog named Sirius, and uh, it was nice. Sometimes it wasn't so nice. Hallways, like I mentioned, every single time you move, you get a list of all the tiles in each direction, which is both entirely technical, and you get it every single time you move, which is a lot of text. So you might think, why do that? Well, here's why corridors are the worst thing. 
you might think that corridors would be kind of straight line connections between rooms, but that's where you would be wrong. <laughs> corridors can dead end. Corridors can kind of overlap. Corridors can do whatever is going on <laughs> on the left side of this screen, which is a legit screenshot from NetHack. I did not make this up. <laughs> and even worse, they can change during gameplay. If you leave a dwarf to his own devices with a pickaxe, by the time you get to him, he will have dug a whole new corridor in his search for gold. And furthermore, since there is gold and dwarves and monsters in these hallways, you can't skip them. So we'd first thought, well, you know, navigating hallways is hard. Maybe we'll make it so you can kind of automatically move between rooms. Gave up on that right away because navigating between rooms is not at all something you can represent in a simple way. And then we thought, well, maybe we can give an immersive description, like you head down a hallway and you see it branches to the left and right. Well, no. <laughs> As you can see, most of the time hallways will not fall into a easy to describe way like that. So it came down to just the only way we could give enough information to reliably navigate every hallway you came across was to give you all of the information of here's all of the tiles in each direction. And it was definitely the most kind of frustrating part now of playing visually impaired net hack, but hard to get around. And the reason for that is the, the kind of number one problem with doing accessibility in these games, which is that giving precise kind of spatial location information using text in a way that's not really technical and verbose is really hard to do. And you can tell because if you look at the best example of doing things with text in games, which are interactive fiction text-based games like Zork or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they don't even try. <laughs> they go with what I said earlier, which is an abstraction where you're in a room and you can pick up things in that room and you never have to worry about like, am I next to the table with the toothbrush on it? You don't have to do that because it's hard to do. And you might think, well, maybe we can do that in NetHack. Well, if we had an example like this and we tried to say, you see a wand and a kobold to the southwest of you, it doesn't answer all kinds of questions. Oh no. Just uh. I'll just keep talking. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't tell you if you can get to that wand before the kobold does. It doesn't tell you if there's enough room for you to go around and avoid this encounter altogether. It doesn't tell you if you're lined up right to be able to zap your own wand. So really, to be able to play NetHack in the way it was kind of meant to be played, you need to know exactly where things are. So you can't get away from this problem of how do I give that information as text. So when we ended our study, we were successful in that we made a version of NetHack that you can play without having to see the map. Don't get me wrong, it is frustrating. <laughs> it is very difficult, even compared to the baseline difficulty of playing NetHack at all. Uh, but it can be done, which is cool, because we were able to do this in only kind of eight months of not full-time work. And what we really wanted was to show a case study that games of this kind of genre of these kind of ASCII tile-based roguelikes, which are still popular, are really good candidates for accessibility of this kind. And the reason for that is that so much of them is already given as text. And so much of the work for accessibility has already been done. So it's only a relatively small amount of change to take those games to being entirely accessible. But like I just went over, the one challenge that'll be facing any kind of attempts to do that is how to give this precise spatial information in a way that's concise. And it was something that we were able to solve in some cases and not in others. And that's going to be the big thing that future work would also have to try and find better ways to deal with. An interesting thing is that just in between like the few months when we finished our research and me giving this talk now, there's already been some cool stuff going on in this area. NetHack 3.6 came out while we were working on the research, which was hilarious because NetHack hadn't had an update <laughs> in many years. And then as soon as we were in the code base and had made our changes, they put out a new one. So now our work is out of date. But <laughs> the cool thing is that NetHack 3.6 added the ability to list the location of monsters and objects on the map. And I don't know if the dev team did this because they were thinking of accessibility. I don't know the dev team. But this is super cool. They actually implemented something really similar to what we were doing. And it's kind of buried a few menus deep, so it's not quite as useful. But it's a good step in that direction. And I've even seen that one of the NetHack devs might be bringing um, changes inspired by our work into the next NetHack release. 
So there's been interesting advances in that front. And there's also a project called Brogue Speak, which is in development right now, which is a 100% accessible version of Brogue. And what that is is it's uh, screen reader free, so it doesn't give you text. It actually kind of internally converts that text into spoken audio and sound effects and things like that. And it's kind of picking up steam, and there's been some good feedback from visually impaired players so far. So this is kind of an active area of development, and there's a lot of potential for future accessibility in this genre, and I think we all want everyone to enjoy how great roguelikes are. I want to give a special thanks to Roguelike Radio. They had a podcast episode about accessibility that was really useful in our research. And I want to thank all of you for coming to my talk. That uh, concludes. And if we have time for some questions, then that'd be great. Yeah, okay, so the question is, do I have any specific kind of resources for accessibility that I can point developers at? Well, one that does come to mind is that there's a forum called audiogames.net, I believe, and that's a kind of big place where visually impaired players uh, hang out and talk about games they've found and talk about their experiences, and that's a good place to get feedback from visually impaired users. They're always active and looking for new games. That's where I talk to them. and. Yeah, that's the one that comes to mind to check out if you're interested. So we talked about like representing objects in rooms. How do you represent rooms themselves? Because oftentimes rooms are really complicated. Like they'll have a, there'll be a rectangle, but there'll be like a tiny little divot in that rectangle, or like two, and that's really important that the cobalt is in not a completely linear path, but in this weird divot. Yeah, our changes. So the question, yeah, is. Um, what about when rooms themselves are abnormal? So I talked about telling you about objects that are nearby when you're playing the game, but what if the room is kind of a weird shape and there's a little side area and the kobold's hiding in there? Uh, well, the thing, NetHack at least is nice in that in the dungeon levels, which are the first several levels, it's pretty much rectangular rooms. Uh, but then you do get into like the dwarven mines, which is just, there's no rhyme or reason to the dwarven mines. <laughs> And so definitely, yeah, our, our changes don't work as well in those cases. There is a command where you can choose a direction. It'll tell you how many tiles away the nearest kind of wall is. So that helps you get a sense of how big the room is. But when you're in those kind of more abstract locations, the view command works and that if you can see it, it'll tell you where it is. But definitely, it's a lot harder in something like the Dwarven Mines or an oddly shaped room to give a, a better description. In that case, you'd probably use like the feel uh, command I talked about to feel out the shape of the room. So, yeah. Are you planning to do any more work in this field? Uh, the question is if I'm planning to do any more work in this field. I've graduated and I'm working in game development now, a company called Beamdog. Uh, so they did Dungeons and Dragons kind of games. So I'm not working in it as much. I'm hoping to kind of be a bit interested in it as a hobby, but I've graduated and kind of moved on a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. Yes? Sorry, what uh, kind of? How do you sort of spatialize audio? So like uh, hearing where something is in terms like it's louder if it's closer, that kind of idea? Yeah, so you talked about sort of stereo and yeah. directional. Okay, yeah. So the question is, um, how useful is kind of directional, spatialized audio? And yeah, that's something that I looked into. There's, um, there's things like there's a version of Doom that's uh, completely spatialized uh, directional audio. It's like visually impaired, accessible Doom, which apparently is pretty fun. <laughs> uh, so that is something that works in a lot of other genres, like shooter kind of type games. That can be better. The problem with a game like NetHack is that you do need to know more specifically what tile exactly things are in. And it's not always as useful to just know there's something in that direction. Uh, I do think it might be worth looking into if there could be a combination of the two, where you had the kind of directional audio 
as well as being able to get the specific information, I think that would be worthwhile. Uh, it was beyond, we talked about it in our research project, we didn't have the time for it, but I think that would be an interesting kind of combination. I don't think it would be sufficient on its own in a game like NetHack, but I think it could help out and help deal with that problem of having too much text. So yeah, good question. Yeah. Like what, what's your feeling if, or like, say like hypothetically you go Angry in another game, like what do you, what, what advice would you give there where you kind of have to deal with the quarter problem at all? Right. So the question is, in other games like Angban and stuff like that, where the rooms aren't as predictable as NetHack, and you're kind of constantly in this hallway situation of having weird shaped rooms, how do you deal with that and what kind of advice? That's definitely like the, the harder case. And Auto Explorer is definitely a kind of good solution to that. I think that the Auto Explorer is best if it can be combined with also having other ways to orient yourself in the map. Because like I said, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup has Auto Explorer, and that does make it accessible, but players find it disorienting because they don't have any actual positional information about where they are in the map as a whole. So I think if you could combine being able to Auto Explore, but also being able to, whenever possible, know your location. Things like having maybe the absolute coordinates instead of, because I use local coordinates mostly where it said like it's two tiles north of you. Having absolute coordinates like you're 50 tiles right into the dungeon would maybe help a player feel more oriented in the dungeon as a whole. So something like that might help. Um, Auto Explorer probably is useful enough that when it can be done, it should be done. Um, because again, that's another example of giving players the option. Because then if they do want to auto explore, then that does make the game a lot easier to play. But um, some people are more hardcore <laughs> about it and really want to do it themselves. So yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, it's, if anyone wants to ask me after, it's a break now. But uh, yeah, it's break time. So thanks a lot.